Johnny Silverhand's memories are lying to us throughout Cyberpunk 2077. The reasoning behind this is that a large portion of Silverhand's memories and dialogue shown in 2077 are either fragmented and damaged or directly falsified. The causes vary from narcissism, cyberpsychosis, radiation and engram damage, as well as outside sources directly editing Silverhand's memories. Now if you're familiar with my channel, this will be a recognizable topic. I previously made two videos covering the idea that Silverhand in some fashion is either lying to be or completely unaware of his fabricated reality. These videos barely scraped the surface of this topic and were primarily created to get interaction and conversation within the community started. Everyone had amazing input within the comments and there's no limit to the analysis from the community. Now weeks later, after consistent research, discovery, and interaction with the community, I can continue on to create this video. I will be placing my cyberpunk playlist below for those interested in the previous videos, however, they won't be necessary for this video, besides learning what has led up to this point. Yet again, I just want to thank everyone watching for the support. Now getting into this topic, we need to keep in mind that these flashbacks are not brain dances. Silverhand's flashbacks are connected to his own memories and neural network. We can see in the sequence as the Never Fade Away gig begins that we are enhancing our link to Silverhand's neural network and memory from the chip. We aren't seeing a pre-recorded brain dance that shows the objective truth. It is more of a dream sequence, and Silverhand has been within Soul Prison for 50 years, leaving plenty of time for his own memory to betray him, as he could easily forget specifics, create false perceptions, and details, or simply want to remember himself as more of a hero to avoid being stuck in a loop of regret alone for so long. Within 2077, while interacting with Alt's AI form, Alt states, What you saw was his subjective view of what happened, a warped account of events he locked away in his subconsciousness and replayed time and time again. It bears no resemblance to the truth. This statement, in a sense, is coming from a creator of Soul Killer and Soul Killer itself. Alt knows that Silverhand's engram is corrupted. Though the specific reasons aren't clearly stated, we can assume that not only have his memories become foggy and mixed, but his engram itself is distorted. We can assume as well that the AI, despite not being Alt herself in her complete form, has a more accurate detailing of the events that occurred, leaving the AI capable of comparing both Silverhand and Alt's memories side by side. Within 2077, we can find constant inconsistencies presented to us by the engram of Johnny Silverhand. In relation to Silverhand's time within the military, the engram states that he participated in the Second Central American War in Mexico, while in reality Johnny was sent to Nicaragua instead. The engram states as well that his dog tags belong to a soldier who sacrificed his life to save Johnny. Despite this though, the tags have Johnny's original birth name. Robert John Lindor, rather than their colleagues. Though this could be interpreted as some deeper meaning, it is unlikely. If this claim was to honor his friend, Silverhand would have changed his name to Robert John Lindor, rather than Johnny Silverhand, in order to actually honor his friend. More than likely, the Ingram makes this claim as they are unaware of their own original name. This possibility would be supported by his memories being corrupted or altered by an outside source. The Ingram later claims that he once thought about inviting Rogue to the cinema, but when V asks her about it, she states it was her idea instead. This claim helps to support that Silverhand remembers himself in a much better light than is in reality. He believes himself to be the romantic who cares about others, though he had completely discarded Rogue and caused their original breakup. One of the most apparent altered sequences would be Silverhand's concerts in 2023, before assaulting Arasaka Tower and his concert in the 2013 flashback before Alt's kidnapping. Seeing as Samurai had been disbanded since 2008, it wouldn't make sense for there to be two additional concerts afterward, directly before these major events, especially since Silverhand had to reunite the band for the 2013 riot. During the 2013 concert, we see heavy visual distortions throughout the show, hinting at alterations being made to his memories, and even possibly pieced together. Though we do only see Carrie during the show, the playing of a samurai song wouldn't make sense as Silverhand was solo at this point. In 2023 as well, it is clearly two memories pieced together, as Silverhand walks out of a concert directly going into a helicopter. Despite this being a Militech operation, they clearly wouldn't begin their off outside a concert. 
I'm going to be giving summary readings of the essential silver hand stories throughout the tabletop RPGs such as 2013, 2020, Firestorm, and Red. These will be to give a more detailed canon story from the tabletops to you all in order to better understand what I will be referencing. There will be analysis directly after each story, so feel free to skip them as I'll have the video time stamped. Silverhand's apparent falsifications begin as early as his first official story, Never Fade Away. Famed rocker boy Johnny Silverhand plays a show at the Hammer nightclub in Night City whilst accompanied by his girlfriend Alt Cunningham. After the show, they slip out of the back entrance to avoid the crowds and are spotted by a group of punks in the alleyway ahead. They don the colors of the Ice Brothers gang and invite Johnny for a post-gig drink. Sensing danger, Johnny graciously forgoes the celebrations and positions all out of danger and behind the side without his cyber-enhanced namesake arm. Johnny readies his weapon, but he's too slow. A trio of punks jump him, and he's knocked out in seconds before Alt is kidnapped. Slipping in and out of consciousness, Johnny vows revenge. A media by the name of Thompson observes the scene from a distance. His being there is no coincidence, and he waits until the violence is over, knowing the odds are against him. He approaches Johnny and calls him a trauma team, using his personal card. The doctor working on Johnny is a familiar face, one he has seen from the operating table time and time before and had previously installed Johnny's iconic namesake Silver Hand. The doctor treats Johnny like a son, especially since his actual son, and Johnny's best friend, was killed several years before. Among the work carried out, Johnny receives several feet of synthetic intestine, none of which will be seen thanks to the work of modern medical technology. Will he works, the doctor chastises Johnny, rhetorically asking, when is he going to give this type of life up? Thompson introduces himself as Johnny gears up for a fight with the unknown enemy. He reveals that his attackers were not simple punks, but rather professionals hired by the Arasaka Corporation. However, they weren't there for Johnny, but rather for Alt. Thompson explains that by killing Johnny, the job would have looked like a typical street hit and divert that attention from Alt's kidnapping. He then informs an oblivious Johnny of Alt's involvement in developing Soul Killer an unimaginable piece of software that can quite literally remove the mind of a netrunner and imprison them in a digital world. Johnny, aware of the software, is shocked by the revelation that his girlfriend created the piece of software described as the closest thing to hell on earth. It is revealed that Arasaka are developing their own version, and it is only a matter of time before they recruit it all, though in this instance, obviously not willingly. Thompson reveals his own grudges with the Megacorp, and the pair agree to team up to rescue all. The duo head to the Atlantis, a rundown Night City bar bustling with the contacts looking for work. Johnny is after the solo rogue, his former lover and part of the Rogue Santiago duo, a highly recommended solo team, reportedly earning up to 5,000 eddies a night. Initially hesitant at the request, Santiago bargains for 30,000 eddies, and the deal is made, turning the duo into a team of four. Before further details can be discussed, the party is interrupted by a corporate goon looking to finish Johnny off, though he is no match for Rogue who swiftly takes him out. Rogue, Santiago, and Thompson take out four more goons that spring up behind the bar, whilst Johnny narrowly avoids a shot that kills a nearby patron. The team retreat Johnny's Porsche, as Thompson deduces that they were tracked by his trauma team card. Before they make it to the car, an Arasaka AV-4 appears overhead as Rogue is the first target in their sight. Before she is gunned down, Thompson takes the AV out with a well-placed shot from his grenade launcher. Ditching the car to avoid another ambush, the team head off on foot. Santiago takes the lead, followed by Thompson and Johnny, with Rogue bringing up the rear. Elsewhere, elsewhere, Will Cunningham is surprised not to find herself in the company of the boosters that kidnapped her, but rather in the relative comfort of an Arasaka facility. She is greeted by Toshiro Arasaka and his bodyguard Akira. After being offered a drink, Alt notices the way in which Akira moves, like that of a professional killer, and decides against making a move against her mysterious kidnappers. It is revealed by Toshiro that all had been nabbed to work for them, a fact that calms her nerves and changes the dynamic of the situation. However, the conversation turns sour when he brings up Soul Killer. The team of Johnny, Thompson, Rogue, and Santiago are lying low at the abandoned Mark Luxor Hilton Hotel. 
Santiago then suggests attacking Arasaka head on at their facility on the edge of town, as Alt is either there or has been shuttled back to Japan to the Arasaka HQ. Rogue in agreement suggests the attack sooner rather than later, as Arasaka's main forces are probably still patrolling the streets rather than guarding the HQ. Whilst Johnny is running diagnostics on his arm, Thompson reckons that the Soul Killer program is probably only able to run on the mainframe in the Arasaka facility. The group then begin planning the assault. All is plugged into the Arasaka mainframe with the intention of recreating Soul Killer by memory. Arasaka Netrunners watch her every move and dissuade her from trying anything. Not that any of it matters, however. Her body lies on the couch of Toshiro's office in a near comas host state as she is running through the nets. She thinks back on how she originally created the software, initially creating it as a harmless program to contain artificial personalities, before later discovering that the software could contain living personalities as well, as seamless transfer back and forth, essentially creating immortality. When her employer ITS discovered the work, they set about creating it as a digital prison that kills the body and traps the mind indefinitely. Alt realized that it was only a matter of time before they either kill her or test the software out on her. The team have made their plan, an impromptu samurai concert on the green outside the Arasaka building. The idea is perfect, to raise a literal army of fans and something Arasaka will never see coming. By noon, the whole city knows. The band is samurai, the time is sundown, and the beer is free. As the day goes on, a restless mob converges on Arasaka Tower. All deep in the Arasaka mainframe, it makes a breakthrough with the Soul Killer copycat. She manages to create an artificial construct within the machine, one that Arasaka has not yet noticed, a controller override that may hold the key to her survival. Seiko Harada, a member of Arasaka security and a Japanese native, watches the scenes unfold opposite the main entrance of the facility. He watches as Johnny Silverhand takes the stage, knowing it would cause a massive riot if he were to take him out. He breaks in a song, his smash hit chipping in, all the while scanning the crowd building the atmosphere and watching as his team gets in position, ready for Johnny to create a diversion. However, Arasaka creates it themselves. The guards go over the edge. Too much stress causes them to open fire on the crowds. It is not enough as more than 6,000 rabid fans pounce and storm the lobby of Arasaka. Santiago covers the crowd, picking off guards with his high-powered sniper rifle. Rogan Thompson enter the lobby disguised as the members of Iron Sights, a known Arasaka collaborator. Johnny joins the pair, covered in a bloody Arasaka guard's jacket, the name of a tang reed Sanko Karada. The trio move up throughout the building, evading the Arasaka security before hopping onto the top of the elevator cars to avoid the gunfire. As they approach the upper floors, she activates the shaped charges that have stopped outside the executive offices. Toshiro approaches Alt, wary that the time is short and Johnny could burst in at any moment. He orders Acura to hold Alt, and asks his techs if the software is ready. They confirm and he jacks into the mainframe and tests the program at Alt, ripping her mind out of her body. In the mainframe, Alt trawls through information on Arasaka, diverting funds from Saburo Arasaka's personal accounts, wiping the software's code, fries the brains of the three Netrunner techs, and uses the room laser controls to burn Acura's cyber optics. Toshiro watches on in astonishment, complimenting Alt's skills in escaping her certain doom. As she goes to transfer her mind back into her body, the explosive charge goes off. Toshiro disconnects all from her cyber deck by accident, as he throws himself on the ground in an attempt to shield himself as the trio burst in. Johnny rushes to Alt, but realizes it's too late. Her lifeless body rests on the couch as her mind is lost in the machine. Thompson starts to broadcast the scene, his big scoop to take down Arasaka as he confronts Toshiro. However, a defeated Johnny tells him to cut the feet before he shoots Toshiro dead. Johnny leaves with Alt's lifeless body as her digital form silently screams from inside the mainframe. Never Fade Away leaves us with a heart-wrenching scene within our heads. Alt is trapped within the mainframe as Silverhand walks away. Throughout this story, we are given major characterizations of Silverhand that help to build upon exactly why his memories are unreliable. His clear narcissism throughout the story shows an unreliability 
and what we see in 2077. Silverhand's narcissism and ego are the first indicators that his memories would be presented falsely. Narcissists commonly remember specific events incorrectly and even reform their own memories to boost their own ego. From the moment all is connect, he is completely self-absorbed within his own ego, believing Arasaka's involvement was purely to get back at Silverhand. He is completely clueless of Alt's importance and line of work, even immediately writing her off as one of the many netrunners of Night City. Over the duration of the story, he drags others such as Alt and Santiago into the mix, endangering their lives without giving them an actual decision to be involved. He cares only about himself and his goal of saving Alt. Once the riot is formed, he even sends thousands of his fans to a possibility of death and blends with the crowd. Once within the room with Alt, Silverhand completely disregards the possibility of saving her. This is as well where his memories become distorted from reality. Within the TTRPG, it is Toshiro who throws himself under the ground and accidentally disconnects Alt from the cyber deck. However, in 2077, Silverhand immediately shoots Toshiro and disconnects Alt from the system. In both scenarios, Silverhand makes no attempt to re-plug Alt or to try to find a way to save her before disconnecting. I believe in a psychological sense, this is Silverhand's way of blaming himself for Alt's death. Within the same story, we can see the cyber-psychonic tendencies Silverhand is guided by. Within Never Fade Away, the Hand is referenced several times to be leading Silverhand to commit unreasonable acts of violence, guiding him along and being the point of blame by Johnny. Silverhand's psyche is clearly going off the deep end, and he isn't even in control of himself at several points. The hand was confirmed as well as Silverhand's cyberpsychosis expression. We see his violent urges be led by the hand as he shoots Toshiro, but also within 2077, when given the choice of punching Thomas, regardless of a decision you select, Silverhand is dragged by his cybernetic arm into a fit of rage, relentlessly punching the media until he's pulled off by Rogue. Whether this scene is canon is honestly unknown to me, as it occurs directly after where it would have in the tabletop. The combination of narcissism and cyberpsychosis already brings Silverhand's memory of his past into question, though the psychological effects brought onto Johnny aren't even the most convincing explanations to his memories being falsified within 2077. Moving past the Never Fade Away 2013 adventure, the next important event that contains the majority of Silverhand's memory errors would be the 2023 Arasaka HQ bombing. This event happens to be the most important to Silverhand's story of becoming an engram, but it also happens to be the most controversial and misunderstood. There happens to be a group of the community that tends to pass all the inconsistencies within the 2023 raid off as retcons. This is not the case, and I believe is the fallback reasoning for not wanting to think any further on the topic. I do not say this to criticize this group, but rather much of the community has settled and refused to search any further. All of us should be helping to piece together the timeline. Those who claim they are retcons with no evidence, despite Pondsmith saying otherwise, are settling. I will be reading a summary of the Arasaka raid, so like before, if you would like to skip the narration, the video will be timestamped so you can do so. The bulk of speculation, explanation, and analysis will be done directly after the summary. During the Fourth Corporate War, on August 20th, 2023, a Militech incursion team led by Morgan Blackhand and Johnny Silverhand attempted an infiltration mission into the Arasaka Towers of Night City in order to copy or destroy the Arasaka Corporation's Reliquary Database Project and erase the Soul Killer program from their network. The idea was to render the database project unusable for the rival corp by using a tactical nuclear device within the planned area, a heavily shielded complex, to absorb the impact of a blast and prevent mass destruction. Johnny Silverhand led Team Alpha, consisting of a few Militech Special Ops, a portion of a group of Aldecados known as the Lobos, the Solos Rogan Shaitan, the Media Lyle Thompson, and a Netrunner by the name of Spider Murphy. Morgan Blackhand would instead lead Team Omega with the rest of the Militech Strike Forces. Johnny's team dropped out of an AV on the top floor of the Arasaka Towers, with the mission of infiltrating the laboratories 10 levels down into the building to retrieve Alt Cunningham, who was trapped in the Arasaka network, and destroy Soul Killer. 
It's unknown which path the Omega team took, but the last one to see Blackhand was one of the Lobos, who witnessed him heading down a stairwell with a heavy suitcase. After breaching into the building, Alpha Team rushed to the labs, where Spider accessed the Arasaka computers in order to contact Alt and rescue her. After transferring her into Spider's data suitcase, the Netrunner proceeded to download some kind of information into data chips and uploaded a virus to destroy any information regarding Soul Killer from the Arasaka network. When questioned by Thompson about the data chips, Spider lied to him, saying they only contained information on the Arasaka development team and other basic corporate knowledge. Alpha Team was suddenly attacked by Adam Smasher and a group of Arasaka troopers, taking down many of the Militech operatives and Lobos in the first attack, badly injuring Thompson and pinning down the rest of the team in the lab. While both groups fired at each other, Spider snuck to her data suitcase in order to connect to the net and scatter the various portions of Alt, each tagged with a marker with the hopes of finding them someday. During these events, Johnny, who had been knocked off by the initial attack, managed to stand up. With the Militech SMG on one hand and his Malorian on the other, he shouted and provoked Smasher, futilely emptying his guns on the Borg. Smasher turned around and fired his auto shotgun at him, cutting Silverhand in half. Shaitan, taking advantage of a distraction, grappled and immobilized Smasher, telling the rest of the crew to leave. Spider Murphy tried to reach Silverhand, but Rogue stopped her telling the Netrunner he was gone. Spider reached inside her jacket and pulled out a data slug Alt had downloaded to her a long time ago. Whispering she was sorry to Johnny, Spider inserted the chip into the back of a dying rocker skull. She then tried to reach for a data suitcase, but soon realized it had been destroyed in the crossfire. Wishing Alt good luck, Spider helped a rogue and the surviving Lobos to drag the wounded Thompson into the elevator. Spider knew Johnny would be avenged, and while touching the remaining data chips in her pocket, she knew Rage Barmas would be as well. With their mission complete, Alpha Team began their extraction. Once on top of the building, they got into the rescue AV. It was during the lifting off when they saw Morgan Blackhand going up against Adam Smasher on top of the Arasaka Towers. A few minutes later, once the AV was quite far away from the building, a nuke went off. In the aftermath, a Borg firefighter named Samantha Steven, who was a fan of Silverhand, accessed a wrecked bunker among the ruins of the Arasaka Towers. While exploring the area, Samantha found the body of Silverhand, an unexploded Arasaka nuclear device. Realizing how dangerous it was, she emptied its contents into the depths of Del Coronado Bay and hid Johnny's body in a new crate to preserve it. At some point, she also retrieved some of Johnny's possessions including one of his Malorian 3516s and his Porsche. She hid all of these items, including the bomb case, in her own garage somewhere in Night City. She protected and took care of them for decades, preserving the vehicle in its pristine state by keeping it in cold storage, and maintaining the weapon's functionality by using Cosmoline. We first need to account for the reasonings behind Silverhand's memories being lies that are already confirmed by Pondsmith. Pondsmith, on his official Reddit account, states that Johnny's recollection of the events that day are scrambled from the rad damage his body took in the process of recording his engram. He as well states that CDPR and him have agreed that Johnny is an unreliable narrator at best, and that the bomb that went off was detonated by an unknown person but Militech and Manusa both decided to pin the blame on Arasaka Inu. This statement shows that there is in-lore damage to his body in Ingram recording, which could cause his memories to be incorrect, as well as his own narcissism causing him to be an unreliable narrator. This helps guide us into what went differently in the raid compared to 2077. Within the TTRPG canon, it was both Morgan Blackhand and Silverhand who led the Militech op to raid Arasaka HQ. The goal was to destroy or copy the Arasaka Reliquary database project. Silverhand was not the one to be given the bomb in this situation. It is more than likely Blackhand who was tasked with planning the mini nuke as he was last seen headed down to the lower floors of the tower with an unmarked heavy suitcase. Silverhand as well was killed in his initial encounter with Adam Smasher, only to be soul killered and have his ingress created on the spot by Spider Murphy in his final moments, with the chip she had been given by Alt. This initial encounter and death can be seen within 2077's flashbacks, but there is an extremely suspicious cut the moment Silverhand is meant to be killed. The rooftop scene that takes place after this cut 
originally occurred with Blackhand, being tempted in a battle with Smasher. The presence of memories of Silverhand playing Manuk, surviving his initial encounter with Smasher, only to be defeated on the rooftop, then captured and interrogated by Arisaka, are extremely out of place. This leads me to be in complete belief that everything that occurred after Silverhand's initial encounter with Smasher takes place within Arisaka's Mikoshi Soul Prison. In planning memories of Silverhand's survival and capture in order to create a realistic interrogation of his Ingram in Soul Prison. This would lead to the presumption that Arasaka wouldn't have to just stop there in order to alter his memories. In planning the memory of a false nuke in order to pin the blame for the mini nuke on rocker boy Johnny Silverhand, it all falls into place perfectly for Arasaka, drawing any attention away from them instead onto a terrorist that everyone can direct their hate at. Most wouldn't even know he was previously a famous rocker and veteran due to the data crash. What is left to ponder is when did Arasaka get a hold of Silverhand's Ingram and or body from Samantha Stevens and why? What would lead them to eventually locate his Ingram and use it as their prototype for the biochip? As well as why would Adam Smasher have Johnny Silverhand's possessions stored on the Ebunike cargo ship? All these questions can actually be answered using the previous text, 2077, and the story Black Dog, contained within Cyberpunk Red. Yet again, I'll be reading a summary of the story for those interested, but there will be a timestamp for those who would like to skip to analysis and explanation. One day, while Lilea was looking for a complete version of an old recorded song, Trace helped her by uploading its lyrics on the data pool. 20 minutes later, they received a message. After gathering the whole party, they followed the lead, which eventually got them a job to transport a mysterious crate to the east, to New Mexico. This task was given by Samantha Stevens, who as well gave Silverhand's previous Malorian to the edge runner Zara. While on the road, the gang encountered a group of nomads, whom they traveled with for a while. It was there where Trace met a 40-year-old man, a former Lobo of the Aldecados, who recognized the young media. While talking about Trace's father, the old man proceeded to enlighten him by explaining what he recalled of the events that caused the Night City Holocaust of 2023, an operation the old Aldecado himself had been a part of. Not long after crossing the New Mexico border, both groups were on their separate ways, following their findings on the crate they were transporting, which was a large tube covered in numbers and many words in Japanese, and marked in its center was a radioactive warning. They figured out it was probably a nuke that Arasaka had been keeping. This was confirmed later when Michiko Arasaka managed to reach them after having gone behind their trail for some time in order to assure the bomb didn't end up in, in bad hands. She told them what had really happened the day the Arasaka towers collapsed, telling them how Arasaka had hidden a powerful nuke beneath the towers just in case Militech reached their defenses during the war only to later find the remains of the Militech mini nuke within the hot zone, but not their bomb. In the end, they managed to locate it, and decided to leave it where it was until Trace and the rest of his group got the job to transport it. The media was a little shocked on hearing the revelation. With Michiko's protection, the group continued their mission, finally reaching the facility in Los Alamos where a woman by the name of Angel took the bomb from them in order to properly dismantle it. During her calm link with Samantha, her Night City friend revealed that she was dying of cancer due to the radiation she had received after moving the Arasaka bomb shortly after the AHQ disaster of 2023. Angel responded that she shouldn't have done it, as she could have waited until she was able to send help. Samantha smirked, as she reminded her friend that they didn't know who or what owned the bomb at that time, so she had to move quick. This gave her enough time to recover all the important things from the wrecked bunker under the ruined Arasaka Towers, and enough time to get rid of the hot stuff at the bottom of Del Coronado Bay. Angel thanked her for having done all that, and asked if there was anything she could do to help her. Samantha shook her head, and said that she had promised to deliver him to Angel, and after finally finding the right people, she had kept that promise. With that, Samantha could finally take some time off, and when she felt it was the time, she would shut down her life support machine. Not long after the conversation with Samantha, Angel approached the bomb. She carefully rolled out its casing, and introduced a code into the small exposed keypad. After a hissing of compressed air, the bomb's casing split in two, revealing the blue-white ice of a hidden Cairo chamber instead of a nuclear device. Tenderly looking down, 
Angel glimpsed the dark, frozen face behind the curtain of ice, while whispering, Hello, my love. If you hadn't already realized, it was Silverhand's body transported in the new crate by the Edge Runners. Angel, who looks nearly identical to Alt, receives the body for an unknown purpose, claiming that Samantha Stevens isn't the only Silverhand fan. Though this story is where Silverhand's story officially leaves off before he's implanted in a V's head in 2077, we can make several educated inferences to piece together the rest of the story. We know that Angel being Alt is a highly probable outcome, seeing as Alt had originally worked on Soul Killer in order to put personalities into cloned or compatible bodies to essentially create immortality. She was also fragmented and spread across the net, so if her full personality hadn't been Soul Killered and placed into a body, we know at least a portion of her could have been similar to the AI alt we see in 2077. I also want to bring up the idea that Angel very well could have messed with Silverhand's Ingram herself in order to protect information on her and Silverhand, which would explain the random concert directly before the 2023 Arasaka raid, Silverhand's unawareness of his original name, and other minor detail confusions throughout 2077. Though these alterations wouldn't be the bulk of the inconsistencies we see within 2077. With all the information Trace had managed to obtain, he wrote several exposés and books about the Fourth Corporate War in the time of Red. With this story published in the early 2040s, The Big Lie, a deception created by President Kress to blame Arasaka for the 2023 Holocaust, crumbled. This publication backfired against Militech and the Noosa driving Night City to realign itself with Arasaka rather than the United States. Arasaka, for reasons related to maintaining good graces with Night City, looked to track down their previously unlocated nuke alongside their search for Alt Cunningham in the net. Their search for Alt had begun with her original disappearance in the Arasaka mainframe, but continued with their child netrunner training program, in which children like Lucy were sent into the net to search for old knowledge and even Alt's Ingram. As a result of searching for their lost nuke, Arasaka, by complete coincidence, comes across Silverhand's body and Ingram as well, since it had been stored in a nuke crate and transported under the veil of the nuke. Now, while it is unknown whether they encounter Alt as well, or if they even retrieve Silverhand's actual body, we know that they now have the Ingram. This is when they place the Ingram in a Mikoshi and begin to mess with Silverhand's memories and data. Arasaka implants false information in order to feed into Silverhand's ego and make him believe he was responsible for more than he was in order to set a specific scene. As well as removing the memory of his death and replacing it with a new memory of being captured alive. This is when they would interrogate the Ingram in Soul Prison under the guise of being directly after the mini nuke had gone off. After interrogating the Ingram, they can now use it as bait to lure out Alt from the Black Wall and capture her AI or clone form. This is similar to the plan that the Voodoo Boys had arranged during 2077, in which they used V and the Relic to lure out Alt within the net. Alongside this, Adam Smasher is ordered by Saburo Arasaka to retrieve Silverhand's body and possessions. Arasaka previously was aware of Samantha Stevens' garage unit that had stored Silverhand's porch and other belongings, so it was no leap in logic that after her death, Smasher easily came into possession of these items. We can assume as well that Smasher hunted down at least a portion of the Edge Runners from Black Dog, seeing as he also gave Silverhand's Valorian Arms pistol to Grayson, which if it was the same edition of the gun, was previously given to Zara during Black Dog, meaning he would have hunted down and killed her for the weapon. Though it's always a possibility, that this was a separate Malorian as Silverhand owned multiple throughout the years. Now that Arasaka had Silverhand's ship, they as well had access to crack into and work with the original Soul Killer data that Alt had uploaded into Silverhand's Ingram. Their plan now was to use the Ingram to continue research on their relic program in order to create a biochip, one that would be able to transfer Saburo Arasaka into a new body upon his death, which occurs in all of the 2077 endings as he takes over his son, Yorinobu's body. From this point on, we are left to wait for additional tabletop content to be released. As a general guideline, I believe the organization, information, and outline within this video will be maintained in the official canon of the tabletops. 
though of course I may have gotten specific details either incorrect or out of order. The soonest possible release we will be able to confirm a large portion of this info will be in the Edge Runners Mission Kit for Cyberpunk Red, which will update Red's weaponry, cyberware, systems, and story up to the year of 2077. Till then, we are left with piecing together what we know, which hopefully this video did well. Overall, we as a community know the timelines of Red and 2077 connect, so it's up to us to piece it together. I hope you all enjoyed the video, and let me know what you think down below in the comments. Do you think we could possibly learn more information about Silverhand's memories in Phantom Liberty? Thanks for watching, and have a great day, chooms.